Hello, hello, welcome, my lovelies. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is another ill communication interview in which I, Ill Gates, interview many amazing humans, especially musicians. And today's very special guest is Will aka Balkan Bump, who is a fantastic Bay Area musician making all the awesome sounds. Will, what's up? What's up? So good to be here. Hey, yeah, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know you've been uh, real busy lately with the new album. Congratulations. Thank Thank you. Debut Balkan Bump record. Hell yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. And uh, man, you got some some big cameos on there. Very, very cool. Big, big collab list, uh, uh, including uh, Closey. It's not uh, right. not easy to get her, her on a record these days. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Yeah, the, the trick with that was like, we started the track like four years ago. <laughs> so, oh, nice. So, <laughs> you know, before she blew up, I mean, a little bit before she like totally blew up, so it worked out well that way <laughs> very cool very cool yeah she's she's awesome super inspired musician and uh yeah you've, you've worked with a lot of really cool other artists like uh, uh, grammatic beats antique you know there's lots of uh lots of really cool stuff for us to talk about but uh um i think one of the, the questions that i would I, I always like to ask people and i think it makes uh makes for a good introductory question is um you know, we all, any professional musician, you, you weren't born a professional musician. No one's born knowing their modulators from their oscillators and their different scales and tonalities and stuff. And you learn these things because you're interested and, it, you know, it's a, maybe a hobby or maybe a passion or something. And you do it and you do it and you do it until there is some kind of a tipping point where you're like, you know what? I'm going to have a real proper go at this. I, I'm, I'm going to be a professional musician. I can do this shit. Um, and I was hoping to ask you about what your tipping point moment was. When did you realize you could become a professional musician? What did it feel like? Please tell us that story. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of funny. I'm so happy you brought that up because I think a lot of people, when they when they think about these tipping points, they're like, there are moments where like some big, huge thing happened and that turned everything around. Right. But in fact, like my tipping point was actually when like, I was, I was out of college in a recession. I had a few, you know, I, I studied music in college. So I always, it was always in my heart, like what I wanted to do. But as you know, it's like a very, it can, it can be a difficult career or like at very least it can be an unstable career where like, first of all, you just have to want it deeply, you know, because you know, if you can imagine doing basically anything else, like as much as music, like most likely those other things might be a smoother path. But like, oddly for me, like I thought like, oh, maybe I like, I like tech, like I'm a tech, like computer geek type of person. So like I had this job working at a music label. I was playing a lot of gigs around town as a trumpet player. I was producing, made an EP, had some little successes, but I was like, you know what? I might I might like try to get like a job at a tech company. I have friends working at Facebook, all these companies. So I was like looking for jobs and like, dude, I'm also like, I'm super like pretty honest. So like in these interviews, be like, do you have any other questions? I'd be like, well, this sounds like a great job. Um, but I'm wondering like, you know, I am a musician. I do want to tour occasionally and every job one by one would just not <coughs> hire me, you know? Yeah. Cause yeah, I was, no I was just, you know, I wasn't going to lie to them, you know? It's, so I, I'm the same way when I'm looking for places. They're like, what are your concerns? I'm like, base. I, are you going to hate me in like 10 minutes after I move in? Like, let's, yeah. like, what's up? You know, it's just, just, it's better to be on the level about that. Kind it of is. So I wasn't getting any, any of these jobs. Um, meanwhile, I was gigging and I actually, I actually was in addition to like doing my own music was, was like DJing like a, I don't know, maybe five, 10 weddings a year. Cause I was kind of at the age that a lot of people were getting married and they're like, Oh, you DJ. I'm like, sure. I can DJ. And then I like did the math. I was like, you know what, if I just, if I just do 50 weddings a year or even, even 30, I could make the same money as I would at a tech company, like as an entry level employee, you know, 
Like if, yeah, because wedding it, gigs they 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 can pay pretty well, especially can, if you're going to set up the sound system and stuff. Exactly. Like, so so uh, you know I'm setting up the sound system. I'm in scene. I'm bringing wireless microphones. I'm setting up a sound system for the ceremony for the cocktail hour. I'm playing trumpet. You know, it's it's a, I'm bringing like drummer and the guitarist. So it's like a whole operation. And I was like, you know, I would rather do that than work at a day job. Like if I'm gonna have a day job, like I could. I, that's a pretty cool day. It's a cool day job. So like I basically the turning point for me was like just realizing that like. I didn't need to get hired by some company. Like I had everything I needed to start like my own business basically. And once that was rolling, I could reinvest that money into like studio gear um, and into like promotion, promotional budget and like paying advances for like collaborators that I wanted to work with, you know, and things like that, that like are so key. Um, and uh, that was actually like my, my turning point. That's like what allowed me to like really pursue my, my original project was like having, having like this wedding business, um, that like awesome. was viable that made it. So I didn't have to get, uh, another day job or like, I, I could just be a full-time musician, you know? And, the, the, and that's one of the things too. It's like, I've, I've kind of come to realize is that there's, there is always a way, like we live in a society where we have like, you know, pretty much total freedom to do whatever you want. And like, even if you mess up, you get like so many second chances in our mm -hmm. society. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like I remember uh, when I was a kid, there was this like uh, substance abuse resource teacher who came to my, my school and he was a mm -hmm. phys ed teacher now in excellent health. And he came in all chipper and he was like, oh, you know, I, I you guys like doing drugs. I loved doing drugs when I was young. Oh yeah, I really made a lot of mistakes. Was hanging, hanging on the wrong side of the tracks with the wrong crowd and doing cocaine, heroin, speed balls, committing crimes to pay for it. And then one day I hit rock bottom and I realized I needed to change my ways. And now here I am happy and healthy as, and, 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 and I'm talking to you today. And I was just like, okay, I know I'm supposed to be realizing that like drugs are bad, okay? But I'm like, man, <laughs> this guy fucked up so much worse than I'll ever fuck up in my life. And he's totally fine. Like he's totally fine. He just made a decision changed. <laughs> you know, like, or like when you see like, like whenever I see those like weight loss gifts and there'll be people that are like 500 pounds. And then there's right. like, you know, be a time lapse over a year and a half. And then they look like a Viking or something. I'm like, wow, I could get so much fatter and then just decide, you know, I mean, it'd be oh, work, yeah. but like, I'm not as far gone as that person. Like, you know, I, you, and you, we get so many second chances and stuff. And it's just like, it really, like, it seems unrealistic if you talk to a bunch of people who've like never rolled the dice in their life. But if you talk to other musicians and stuff, like, it's like the math checks out, man. Like you can, you can totally figure it out. There's always yeah. a way you might have to get creative. You might have to do some like music industry adjacent thing for a bit. But as soon as you're doing something involved in music, that money you're spending on gear is, is an asset and not a totally. liability, you know? Totally. And I, and I think I kind of like benefited because my dad was like a, a self-employed for, he's a journalist. So he was always growing, me growing up, my dad was always looking for work here and there. And then he'd get a, you know, he'd get a book deal and he'd write a book and then he'd like start doing a podcast, you know, podcasting and he'd start like doing radio shows and he was, and then he started a nonprofit and he was always like, because he was self-employed you know, like starting his own businesses and like, and like, I just grew up in that atmosphere. So for me, that comes really naturally, but I think a lot of my friends who are musicians, like maybe they, they've had to, they, they maybe didn't like learn that in music school or like, they didn't realize it's like, oh, you also have to like be a small business owner basically. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, you I, know? I went through years before I realized that I needed to like know how to manage myself before I could get a manager you know, I was always totally. just like, oh, that's no, some magic fairy in a suit. It's just going to see my yes. talent. Sort me out. New, no, new, no, not no, how it works. No. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah, no. I know. I mean, it's funny because like, I, I love my manager and we have an amazing relationship, but like so much of the things that manifest are like, um, are like relationships that both of us have and ideas that we both brainstorm. Um, and then it's just an alley-oop really, you know? between us like whenever something awesome happens it's often an alley-oop like we're setting each other up for success yeah it's been is... it's been great uh great dealing with your your team um yeah and uh, max is your manager max right? yeah yeah max, max is Shout awesome out. i'm a big fan yeah and now now he's, he's managing beats antique you know too like he met he met them through me and then 
they saw like how much he was crushing them on on our collab and they're like oh can you work on some of other our stuff and they're now now he's their manager so it's oh it's kind of cool sweet yeah i i love that whole camp man their whole squad is just so great um so yeah. how, how did you how did you get to know beats antique man so many f- weird funny stories man so like um i mean i i I actually first heard about them, um, must have been a decade ago. Like my friend uh, Joe, Joey McGuire from, from the band Afrolicious, he gave me like a thumb drive with just a bunch of tunes to listen to. I really, Joey just had great music taste. And like there was stuff from all over the world, from all over different time periods. And I had no idea like what was what I was just listening. And I was like, man, what is this Beats Antique stuff? This stuff is amazing. And he's like, oh, those, that's like a Bay Area. Those are friends. They're like Bay Area musicians. Like, I'm like, oh, what? You know? And so I just like from early, like early on in their career, I was like all about them. Um, and like, honestly, I always looked up to them so much. Like whenever I made like my own music, I was that guy, like at a music festival, like, oh, I'm like, oh, I think that's David Satori. And I'd go up to him and like awkwardly stand next to him until he looks at me and then be like, and then like give him my CD. And I, and I did that shit for years with like Tommy and David. And like, I was just some random like trumpet player kid, like looking up to them and, and, um, and Zoe, like. I always was just like, so just like blown away by the fact that like a dancer is like part of the band. Like, Oh, any band that has a dancer that is a full fledged band member, always a cool band. band. Yeah. I I just like, man, this is so hip because like, she's, she's like dictating the compositions. Like she's like, and I've seen them in sessions. She's like, no, that doesn't work. Like, let's do it this way. What if you, like don't don't go to that chord like stick on this chord like total producer like badass music producer and it's all with the mindset of like i'm the one that's gonna have to dance to this so it, it better be yeah. sick <laughs> well it's uh oh god who, who, i love that who, who, who there was this one famous i think it was like it was one of those big uk djs but they were like i don't trust the dj who doesn't dance you know and i always mm. thought that was just such a great quote because you know um music like dance music should essentially be like dance instructions you know and like uh um you know because like someone who's like a professional dancer they can like blow your mind dancing to like Chopin or something you know they don't need the boots and cats but like people who are out at a party they're like kind of awkward they're trying to trying to look cool and like you know maybe meet some people and that they'll be friends with and have a good time it's like they you need to be like no it's okay just follow the instructions and you'll dance fine. And then out comes the composition, you know? So having a, having an actual dancer in the studio, it's a pretty big edge, man. It's a big yeah. edge. Yeah. And she's, she's one of the greatest, like of all time. It's kind of wild. Um, but anyways, for years, I was just kind of like, just like a, you know, fanboying. Um, and then randomly one of the early Balkan bump demos, I think by that time, like Tommy, uh like decided to accept me as a friend on facebook he's like oh, i've seen this guy's face enough i think i know him you know randomly i just sent him like this demo and it was you know it's like balkan music mixed with like edm and tommy spent some time in macedonia and obviously beats antique like explores a lot of those sounds so i figured you know he might be interested in this genuinely like he might actually not a random just like check out my music but like this guy might genuinely be into my music so i sent it to him on facebook messenger and he just happened Cause he gets this shit all the time from random people. Oh, he just day. happened to be like at an airport, like waiting for his flight, literally thinking about what music he should listen to. Like while he's has like a rare 20 minutes of downtime, like right as I sent that note. So he happened to listen to it in real time and write back to me like, Oh, this is sick. Like, I like it. Like, like we should, you know, do something sometime. It was so, like, so how did that feel after so many I was just years? Like, of- <laughs> I was just like, Whoa that's so cool like because like yeah because like so many times like <laughs> i've seen him at show and like it, I'm, not, I'm not doing this like like I, it's not stalking it's just like you know when you, when you see people that like um you really see yourself in in some ways you know it's like you want to surround yourself with those type of people you know yeah and even oh. if you miss the mark and, and end up like with people that are also surrounding themselves with those people that's still a really good place to be you know yeah, I agree. I, I, and especially when it comes to music, like I think one of the most important effects that music has is as a social filter, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's just like, and generally the more, the more specific the music, 
the more the more you're gonna like the people if you also like that music you know I, right I, I really dig it yeah totally. that's 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 super cool so um uh so this this was when you were balkan bump uh but uh you had another project before balkan bump that has a particularly colorful name oh yeah so, yeah uh, um, could you tell us about that yeah alligator spacewalk um wow. so <laughs> yeah. i i love it like it's just so visual i could just yeah like, picture it yeah I have, I have the vinyl in the other room i'll bring it out in a sec but like yeah that came out of like like i was doing a lot of solo music under my name will maggot i had like a trio which was like key key bass and, key, and like moog and stuff like that and trumpet and drums mixed with ableton sampling and stuff like that and then i decided to go big because i was like really 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 into bonobo um Love bonobo. and uh i had actually gotten the opportunity to play trumpet with him on a few shows and oh, i was cool. just like yeah and it was like me and like a trombone player and like a whole string section and it was like this lush orchestral dance music thing and i i was so inspired by that i was like you know i kind of want to do that but like but like my own way, like that lush orchestral thing. But for me, it was more like with like a little bit of like a grimy, like grimy, like hip hop mixed with mixed with that. Um, and I was so motivated and like, I just like or orchestrated all these things for like string section and like learned how to orchestrate through doing this. Um, like it was over at my buddy's house. who's like an incredible Moog player all day, just like recording him doing all sorts of things. Um, and uh, the product was like something that I've like still to this day, like the most proud of probably uh, music that I've made. And we, we did we did several shows with such a large ensemble that we were only able to do like, you know, maybe four or five shows, you know, like we did one big mezzanine show at the mezzanine oh, awesome. in San Francisco. And I was, love that venue. And it was so like nice. incredible. That was like the debut, like album release party. And like um, and then we, we played at like SF Jazz one time, which was really cool. Um, but we just did a handful because it's such it's, it's an expensive band, you know. Yeah, how many how many people were in the band? It was like let me think about this. It was like a three piece horn section, three strings, keys, uh, <laughs> percussion, drums, and guitar. So that's what and, oh, and guest vocalists. So we, I would always have at least oh, two man. guest vocalists. Even just like feeding that many people gets like expensive. yeah, yeah. So it was like I'm only going to be able to do basically really big local shows. Cause it's not well known enough to like take that on the road. So I could only do like maybe like one show a year, <laughs> you know, cause it was so, but yeah. What a show. <laughs> so we did two shows in two years, basically. Um, but, um, and then I was talking about this earlier, but like my heart was totally into that. Um, meanwhile, kind of just on the side, I was just making like, honestly, in my opinion, just kind of like silly trap beats. Um, but like replacing the hi hats, like you know the super fast, with like horn lines. Yes. Like in trap, that I just had this like funny concept of like, oh, I could take like these Balkan brass lines that are like, you know, which is like very much the same similar rhythms to like the hi hats and trap music. It was just like a dumb idea. I was like, oh, I could just make a trap beat, but, hey, but use horns instead of hi hats. <laughs> and it totally worked, <laughs> and, and like, and uh that was getting so much more attention than this like you know huge orchestral like dream of mine just like me playing with like you know really simple drum beats in my trumpet like that that got the attention of my manager got the attention of Talib quality got the attention of grammatic like before I even launched it as a project like that was like a sound that a lot of um a lot of cats in my that I really looked up to were like kind of champion including and Tommy too um yeah. from Beats Antique so um i figured like well this is certainly easier for me to do and i do like it <laughs> a lot and i can always take this somewhere else eventually so why not let's see what happens <laughs> that's that's awesome because i think a lot of people um they have trouble valuing things that 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 come easily you know like there's this kind of natural you know, urge to like make things hard for yourself that I think a lot of musicians like spend years unlearning or just never unlearn. Yeah. And like, oh no. Well, you know, that's, that's the easy way. I can't take, I can't do something that's easy or comes naturally. No, because I am a fancy musician and everything I do is roundabout and difficult. So right. I'm going to reject that and do the epic fancy thing instead to satisfy my ego. 
And so totally. many people just fall into that trap and never get out. So uh, props to you for realizing that, uh, you know, when, when the people have spoken, the people have spoken. Yeah. And like, you know, part of what made it like doable for me too, um, is I told myself like Max, my manager, we talked about it. He, you know, we were, he was looking at the alligator spacewalks. If you knew, we knew we wanted to work together. He was looking at the alligator spacewalk stuff. He was looking at these like Balkan trap beats that had some interest from these different players in the industry. And he was like, I think we should go with that thing. We'll make a name, you know, and I was like, Paul, come on. He's like, Oh, I like that. Let's do it. Um, that's why you pay him the big bucks right yeah, exactly. there. Exactly. That's why you pay him the big exactly. bucks. You got Max. No, he certainly Long worked. Work. He certainly worked for the 20% that I've, <laughs> I've given him. Um, but um, I told myself, and, and honestly, this is like a, this has been really huge for me. I told myself, you know what? I'm going to do this and I'm going to put my all into this for four years. I gave myself an out, but I told myself in that time, like I would think about it, like going back to school for four years. Cause you know, with school, you actually pay money to like learn things, you know? And I was like, I will make some money. I might not make the same amount of money that I would DJ in weddings, you know? Um, but I'm going to make some money. Um, but I'm just going to give it my all. I'm going to, I'm going to tour opening up for people making like making $200 a night and spending $300 to get to the gig. You know, <laughs> like I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to like invest money. I'm going to lose money for a while you know, hopefully it'll start returning. Um, but at the end of it, even if I do lose money after those four years, I'm going to have learned so much about like, you know, the touring economy, the streaming economy, I'm going to meet so many amazing people like yourself, uh, and like develop these relationships that like, I would never do DJ and weddings, you know, this is um, a very healthy perspective. I'm proud yeah. of you. This is good. This is, this is the way, if you're just starting out and you're like, how do you start out? What is the right mental attitude? Like that, that that's, I think a, it just a, a shining example of uh, how to have a healthy and realistic approach to starting cool. a music project. Yeah. Cause like ultimately it's likely to fail is the thing. Like it's likely to lose money and that, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And, and the, the cat, the problem that I see a lot of times people start seeing, Oh, it's not quite working. And then they put a foot half in and then they like do something else. And then, you know, for sure it's ne never going to work. So it's better yeah. to put your all for a finite amount of time period and then just move on if it's and it's gonna be longer than like six months. I would say four years is the exact appropriate amount. Really? Of time. Okay. I mean, because yeah. life works in you know, you have like high school for four years, you have college for four years. Like that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, so it's kind of arbitrary. I, I am in year four right now, and I'm considering um because of COVID, uh giving myself a bumper year, like like make it five before I reevaluate. But I mean, how is how is it not a win? I mean, it, I think it's the whole project to win. And any, yeah. anytime I talk to someone about your music who knows your music, they get super excited. About oh, it. oh, cool, man. I really, yeah. I really appreciate just, hearing that. Just because it's locked down, man. I, th I think, yeah, you get, you get, you get a year extension. But I mean, I would, <laughs> I would say it's already a big fat check mark if you ask me. Yeah. I mean, just like the, the, I mean, the, the just the, the remixers alone on that the, that you got for the album. Is, Dude, it's sick. Oh, you know, fantastic list. And like listening to all of the different ones, I was like, oh, cool. Well, they're all wildly different from each other and they're all sick. great. And before we talk about too many of them, just know, um, like we're kind of surprised releasing them. So, um, okay. Don't give away any of the, 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 okay. Well, secrets. I'm just going to tell you this. <laughs> they're awesome and you should go listen to them. Because yes. especially if you are in the future, like maybe a month or two after this. Right. They're, they're all going to be out. They're all right. going to be out. But right. even now, you should go check them out. Yes. And um, uh, mine <clears throat> comes out on Friday. <clears throat> Friday, April, April 2nd, 2nd, 2021. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this one. I had a Dude. whole bunch of different um, remix gigs at the same time. And this one was like, like something just kind of like unlocked and this one came together in like a different way than all the others and i'm i'm really really excited about it i've been playing it on live streams and stuff and i just oh. can't wait to rock a dance floor with it like i i, I mean, know me too it's, oh i can't wait i can't wait and then, well one of the greatest things about your style too is that it's still going to sound fresh like 10, 20 years from now because of the, the whole Balkan thing. And it's just like, you really got your own vibe happening. And like, you know, 
like fashions come and go, but, but style, real style mm. is eternal, you know? And I think like, you really, you really are onto a good style here. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it, man. And yeah, like you, you definitely, um, you definitely like knocked it out of the park with this remix. Like I, uh, I got to say, like, it is one of the most, and you've probably had this happen too. It's one of the most fun experiences ever hearing a really good remix of, of a piece you've, you've worked on. Especially and, when uh, they do shit you would never think to especially, do. Yeah. And, and particularly because like by the time, I and mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I think a lot of other uh, DJs or producers feel this way too. Like by the time, like a song is already released, you, you know, you, you've probably written like with a lot of my music, like I've been working on it for years. So like, like by the time it's released, I'm quite frankly, like pretty bored of my own music. I mean, I, you know, I love it. It's part of me, but like, so hearing someone else's remix is like finally getting me excited about, it sounds really bad. Like I like my album, but it's yeah, like, yeah. It's but like if you go over to someone's them. house for dinner and they like put on your record, it's weird. You it's know, weird. Like, that's exactly. Weird. It's weird. But, yeah. but, but if they put on your remix of my track, I'm going to be and, dancing, and, you know? Yeah, totally. I feel that. Yeah. I've, I've, so. yeah, I've, had, that, I've had that happen a few times where I'm just like, what is that? You know? Yeah. It's just, it's a, yeah, it's a good time for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so how, how do you say your track title? Because I want to be able to pronounce the, the track title. Oh, yeah. So it's um it's it's nomad slang. Nomad, okay. So yeah, I wasn't sure nomad. if it was nomade because it's spelt like N-O-M-A-D. Right, right, right. Totally. I wasn't sure if it was nomad. So it's nomad slang. Got yeah. it. Okay. That that yeah. makes sense. Um okay, so which, which is well, it's technically it's French, so it's probably not pronounced that way, but it, it's like French for nomadic. Okay, cool. Well, hey, you know what? I think there's probably um, some, at least one listener out there who doesn't know what Balkan music is. Mm. So why don't we just give them a bit of a rundown? Like, okay, so your style is fusing Balkan music with trap beats. You're replacing trap hi-hats with horns. But what right. is up with Balkan music? What's what the is Balkan music? Sure. Yeah, so super, super crash course. I, I wish I had like a, a map I could show you the, the Balkan region, uh, which which is in, you know, Europe. Um, I'm just going to get it up myself so I can like, you can, you can screen share. I mean, oh, yeah, we can. I think, well, this... uh, yeah, let me make sure that your your co host uh, privileges are yes, you are now co host. So feel oh my gosh. free to screen share. Okay. You have the power. Just uh, okay, I'm going to bring up the Wikipedia hey, producers. I got news for you. Loud and boring is still boring. It's time to get your hands dirty and spice up your beats with some fresh drums. So take my new course and learn how I make drums like these. What the track was going? Whoa, okay. They all they're all Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, um, we're looking at a map. We're looking at a map. Looking at a map. So, so the Balkans are like this this colored region. Um sorry, I zoomed in zoomed in way too far and also got too close to the mic there. Um so it's kind of like the area that's like sandwiched between, you know, what people commonly think of as Europe and um, like the, the Middle East and like, you know, Western Asia. So it's like Eastern Europe or Eastern Europe kind of meets Western Asia. Um, and, and that kind of overlap happens specifically like in, in like Western Turkey, especially like some people consider like Western Turkey, almost part of the Balkans. So basically it's this region that's like had, so many different humans living in you had you had christians you had jews you had arabic folks you had um, roman empire there's yeah. all kinds of roman ruins everywhere right yeah and you had you know you have the romani people who like are commonly known as 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 gypsies um i mean and just so many diverse ethnic groups and trade routes um and power structures on top of power structures like you know if you're if you're living in like macedonia here in the middle like like you've had so many different you've had you know the byzantine empire and um you know yugoslavia and um you know the ottoman empire and all yeah, these the empires ottoman. and there's just ruins everywhere from all these different histories and you're you're just like you might if you're if you're roma from macedonia you might speak turkish or you might speak another language and, and it's just an incredibly diverse area with so much with so much history and so many different peoples um and with that comes pretty interesting music. I mean, I think just about anywhere in the world where there's a lot of intersection of like different histories and different peoples, um, you're going to hear very interesting music. Um, and I think specifically for me, it was the music of the Roma people um, who once again, like a lot of folks will use the term gypsy uh, to describe Roma people. I, 
I think that I I personally don't like to use the word gypsy. Isn't um, it like considered a pejorative? In, it is. In it is. It is absolutely used as a pejorative term a lot of times um, in Europe. And um, also, I I hear people say the word "jip" often yes, in America, yes, and Americans yeah. do not know that "jip" is actually a uh, pejorative against the Romani people. Yes, and exactly. It's like super not cool to say. Exactly, it's like saying you Jewed someone out of money, I, and I'm, I'm Jewish, so I, I I'll forgive myself for saying that. Okay, but like you get the pass, it, but barely. But barely, it's like it's like a similar, it's a similar type of thing, you know. Um, and then on top of that, beyond that too, just like the, and, and you know, I think a lot of it comes from good places, but there's a lot of people, especially like in the, in the festival scene that we're in, um, who might use the term like gypsy, they might have like a clothing store called like the hippie gypsy or something like that. And, and they're celebrating their nomadic life. And like, and this, like this, like utopian vision of like, of a, what, what a Romani person's uh, life might be like, but in doing so they're romanticizing something that actually the historically has been, been actually like a very, um, you know, disenfranchised group of people. And it's great to celebrate like the, the aspects of the culture, but like, I think a lot of people don't even realize that, that they're, that they're like reinforcing like stereotypes yeah. um, by, by doing that. So I, I try not to use that word, but, but, but the Romani musicians that I've met and I've studied uh, in Northern Macedonia specifically, like, or just some of the best, I'm gonna turn this off. Some of the best musicians uh, I've ever heard in my life. And, and there, and this is like trumpet players, bands, like the Kochani orchestra, um, who uh, I never had heard of growing up. And I like studied ethnomusicology uh, at UCLA. And I like, I'm a, I'm a student of musical history, but no one had ever showed me like these, these brand, these bands. Uh, and so, okay, when I heard so it, you had to give us a, a, a crash course in Balkan bands. Like what, uh, you like spell them out so people can like type, type their names. Type in the bands. Yeah. yeah so yeah. like what, what, what bands should we look up to? So Kochani, crash? which is also a city in Northern Macedonia, it's K O C A N I. Um, K O C A N I, Kochani. Okay. Cool. K O C A N I. Yeah. And you'll, they're Kochani Orchestra, but you'll find them if you just type Kochani. Um, and that's also the name of the city that they're from. Um, he's, that's, that's one really amazing group. Another guy, and I named a song after him, uh, is Dizom, it's Jombo, but it's spelled D Z A M B O. Wow. Um, and one of the songs on my album is called Jumbo Funk, and it's named after this trumpet player, also from Northern Macedonia. Um, and it's D Z A M B O, and then the last name is Agushevi, so it's like A G U S H E V I. And this is probably one of the reasons why, like, no one ever showed it to me because it's like hard hard to spell some of these names, and it's like yeah. hard to find them. You know, they're not. It's not just like madonna you know it's never that I, I i mean do they ha have websites yeah yeah websites spotify okay, websites. Okay, youtube youtube is honestly the best place because like cats are uploading their like their sets from i mean talk about weddings man oh, a lot oh, of these, these are currently active currently oh yeah yeah active, yeah these, oh, these are these are okay, cats cool. so like the scene is like very very like especially like in the 80s and 90s was like really um really bumping like these these cats were playing all the major festivals in europe and uh doing so many weddings and just you know, uh, all over the place, but these bands are like really crushing. Um, I mean, and they come from a long lineage of musicians, uh, and other groups. Um, but these are some contemporary cats that I, there's, I really there's some dig. pretty good, uh, Balkan DJs too. Like, have you ever seen Dunkelbunt? Dunkelbunt Dude. Awesome. I was literally just texting him like, like an hour oh, ago. No way. Yeah. Yeah. He's out in Austria, but like he, yeah, he's super, he, he's remixed a lot of these cats, like, like Bulban Markovic, who's another obvious one. Um, and then um, Goran Bregovic, who's like a singer. Um, but can, can you uh, spell these names, these last two as well? Because oh man, Bregovic. yeah, yeah, Goran Bregovic <laughs> um, is G O R A N, and then B R E G O V I C. Okay, Goran Bregovic. Um, Got and it. then the last person I want to mention is the Queen. Uh, her name's Esma. She actually like if you just type in Esma, like Balkans, you'll find her. Um, she is like, like truly like the Madonna of the Balkans. Like, um, cr cr she actually just passed away last year, but like the piece. best, yeah. Best vocalist. She, uh, like brought up so many musicians with her. Like you can hear some of her songs in like the Borat soundtrack. Actually, a lot of these bands are in the Borat soundtrack. So if you want right. to hear some sick Balkan music, even though like, like the film has, doesn't take place in the Balkans at all, like. They, well, they really... I mean, that's that's kind of what's so hilarious about the Borat character is like, like it's making fun of 
racist so bad that like most of the stuff has nothing to do with Kazakhstan exactly. whatsoever. Like, yeah. and even the stereotype of Borat is like, it's not really a Kazakh stereotype. It's just no. like, you know, racist people will believe anything. Look how ridiculous this Kazakh character is. It's, oh, like, it's incredible. Oh, it's yeah. so good. Yeah, yeah, that film does not win Best Picture 2020. There, there is no justice. In yeah, it's pretty, pretty incredible. That was a close call. I, I they, they were like, I think I, I never signed an NDA, but they were interested in using one of my songs in one of the trailers for that. And like, I was, it was actually the song that Grammatic and I did together. And like, Dennis Grammatic and I were like so bummed that it didn't happen. Not and not yeah. even because of the money, but just like it's so sick. <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. I mean that that film is like a public service. Like that yeah, was, like when dude, it might have it might have flipped the election. Honestly, like it was it that was close. close. And, it was you know? close. And I mean, I was, that's one thing too. I was like so bummed about COVID. And then one of my friends was like, you know, if it weren't for COVID, we probably would have President Trump still. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. It might might very well be true. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks yeah. Borat. Thanks COVID. <laughs> you know, cheers. Cheers. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, okay, so grammatic. Tell us yeah. about grammatic, you and grammatic. That's, that's such a huge connection. That's massive. Huge. Massive. And he's like a friend of mine now, which is like crazy because like, like, like Beats Antique, like I think it was the first, I think it was hit, hit that jive, that track of his. Um, my friend Zeb showed it to me and like I could just hear myself in that music because there's all this trumpet, there's all this old school jazz stuff mixed with just a really tasteful, modern hip-hop beat you know it had it had that extra that extra snare compression like that extra snap that made it feel of its age but also it was like sampling like classic jazz from gosh probably the 40s in it so i was like man that's my type of producer someone who's taking something from the past and thinking about the future and 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 trying to connect the past to the future um that's that's the, to me like one of the beauties of production is being able to take these different identities musical identities and like make sense of them you know um so i've always been a huge fan of his so like beats antique i kind of just like um i think it was my buddy oz was friends with his manager at the time um okay and i told him like man because i was looking for labels to, to pitch my initial ep to um and i'd already gotten a talib talib quality on one of my one of my tracks and and it was That's like so crazy crazy yeah, I, tell I, that story too but let's do the grammatical yeah. one first okay one at a time. okay one at a time. and uh it was like one of my it was like my biggest reach label was low temp because not only do i love grammatic but i love you know like like you know grizz and ross liquid and all these other projects that that have been associated with that um over the years so i uh my buddy oz sent it to his manager and simultaneously my manager max sent it to his manager um so it was coming from two places. Right, it's a triangulation. You can't resist and, the triangulated demo. No one can yeah, resist the triangulation. Exactly. Demo. And I and I just assume once again, you know. And and I, and, and none of those people were you too. That's also very right. Important. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you have two exactly. other people giving your demo at the same time. Yeah. Who genuinely, you know, like like have your back. Who aren't just doing it because you're paying them or something, you know. Um, and uh, once again, I I just assumed. And by the way, like it's okay if if people just don't write back. Like that doesn't mean they don't like you or anything. Like most of the time, people just don't write back, and it's okay. And I just assume that would be the case. Um, but dude, I'm not even joking. Like literally within 24 hours of that of those emails being sent, Grammatic himself emailed me personally. Like like hey, like I love I love the track. I love the EP. Um, I would love to release on my label. And also like, can I do a version? Can can like. Can, can, we, can I do a version of that track IMO with Talib like on my record? Um, Cause like Talib quality is like an MC that I've always wanted to work with. And also, by the way, I'm from the Balkans and like, like, like my mom and dad, like love your music. They're like back in Slovenia, like dancing to your music right now. And I was like, what? I had no idea he was from the Balkans. I, I, I just assumed he was like from like Denver or something like, yeah. Like he's from Slovenia and like, it's so funny because I'm obsessed with Balkan music and obsessed with his music, but I had no idea he was from that region. And then get this, one of the songs on the EP was called, is called Irfan. And then his dad's name is Irfan. Like That's completely, crazy. like there, you can't find that. Like you can't Wikipedia that. Like I, it was just like this bizarro, like quadruple, like resonance thing where I think he couldn't not, he couldn't not read the email. 
and like look at the songs and, and like dig in a little deeper and, and then like oh i actually do want to work with this guy um so yeah it was bizarro um and uh man like just a few months after that he invited me to play with him uh um just play trumpet with him um we could do our collab and also some of his music a lot of his music has horns on it at a terminal five in new york city on new year's eve that was like sick first time i met him first time we didn't even talk on the phone it was just email um and uh and the show went really well like i i really i think because i've been listening to his music for like a decade like oh you must um, have charts what did what did that feel like like were you like like i after listening to someone's music for so long and like you're just all these coincidences and stuff and then you're getting on stage like what was that moment dude, like? uh like all i could think about was my wireless mic and just hoping it doesn't disconnect like i just found the one thing that could go wrong and i focused all my attention on that oh no <laughs> <laughs> And, and the entire set, I was just looking at the wireless receiver and making sure the light stayed just on blue and didn't flash. Because it's like it flashed, telepathically, meant, just like yeah. Uh, if it flashed, that meant it would be disconnected from my trumpet. A sheer uh, force of will, just holding that wireless connection. Um, but uh, no, man. But I just gave it my all. Like I just said, fuck it. You know, like I, like I'm just gonna jump up there and like, because I, I knew his music well enough, and I know his style well enough that I knew when not to play. Because it's not like he he wasn't very like very important. Here, he wasn't like, here are the horn lines, like learn the, it was like, no, just come play with me on like half my set. And I'm like, wow, okay. That's so, that's so trusting. That's so cool. That he'd like, he, yeah, he, he, he could trust you. At that yeah. Line. And, and a lot of those songs did have horns. So I learned those lines. Um, and then there, but I think, yeah, it was trust, like knowing not to play, like, cause he uses a lot of, um, a lot of breaks and like those moments of silence are like where musicians often would like be tempted to fill in. Yeah. but it's it's actually like the blackout moment when the lights go off and like gotta and then have that come, negative space yeah the negative space so. and uh and yeah i got after that it went really well and then he invited me to do his uh to open for him and play with him uh on the recoil tour which was the album that my track was was on with him um and so we did a whole north america tour we played in vancouver where you're in right now yeah. um and uh, all over the country and it was like kind of like honestly it was like it, it was like like i was 31 at this point and it was like i was looking back to like my dreams when i was like 24 25 you had very realistic dreams wow. yeah and like very i was like wow dreams. like it took that's me like, like six so years so much further than than i could pay my rent playing weddings that's like <laughs> way further than that like way this further. is such a slam dunk <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but it was but it was also delayed it was like like this was like what I wanted to be doing when I was 25, you know? And like, I probably, to be honest with you, I probably wanted to be doing it more when I was 25 than I did when I was 31, you know? Cause when, you know, when you're 31, it's like, Oh, my girlfriend's at home. And like, I, but still very excited. But I, I do think the fact that like, it, it was part like doing that experience, which, which by, by the way, was extremely exciting. And, and, and whenever grammatic calls me like to play with him i'm like on a plane like ready to go because i love working with him um but i think the fact that i've had like a lot of like life experience and like you know even like touring experience like you know driving around the country in minivans and like um and playing a lot of weddings and like having random day jobs like gave me perspective to know like this is special um this won't last forever and if i don't get called back again like i got weddings at home and i have a girlfriend at home who loves me and i got a garden that i need to take care of and like you know and like so i i had that perspective um which i think is cool too because like i think a lot of cats that are like at the level of grammatic themselves have that perspective like they're like they're stoked to be touring and stuff but it's like at the end of the day like they they uh they, they want to be back home making music and they, they love touring everyone loves touring and all but like it's just great to like know that like this these these are just amazing moments we're blessed to have those stages, but like, you can't, you can't like take it for granted. You can't like, and COVID's really taught us all this too. You can't like, oh man, you yeah, can't take it for not. granted. You can't, you can't assume that that's, that that's normal. You know, that, that these experiences are like that everyone gets to have them or that people get to have them for their entire lives and can stay healthy and can stay economically viable their entire life. Like it's so much endorphins that it's like people like you shouldn't even be able to have that experience. Like like 300 times in your life like like really it's just like so much it's like being on these huge stages with like 
you know, people just like singing along to the songs and chanting. It's like, you know, being at like Bonnaroo or like Coachella with, with Closey, just like these crazy experiences that have happened in the last three years. Like, 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 even if none of it happened again, it's just like, it's like, and even if none of it happened at all, like, it's just crazy, like excitement, but at the I'm end of the day, I'm getting excited just hearing about this shit. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. man, when, when can I get back on the road? I know, I know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, man, you know, to be honest with you, I've been doing like, like little barbie, I've, dude, I've been playing at this barbecue place, like for, um, for just like friends, uh, with, with like a little jazz funk combo. And like, honestly, like that's like equally as fun to me. <laughs> like yeah, the right, the right, uh, the right, like intimate gig can be pretty special. You know, too. when you can just kind I of do you and like, and where you can like make mistakes and like just see your friends and like, just get weird. Like, I, I don't know. I like, I love that. It's very different than playing, you know, massive stages or whatever, but like, I, I think it in some ways it's more sustainable energy wise. Like it's not, I'm not yeah. going to like, it doesn't, it doesn't deplete me at all in, in the ways that touring does deplete me, but it still gives me energy. So it's more sustainable in a lot of ways. My, um, my dad, he's like, um, God, he's like in his seventies now. And he's like, plays like three, four nights a week, like guitar plays, plays guitar. And the, the, the main gig that he plays is literally two blocks from my parents' house. And he'll just like walk over there, play guitar, drink with his buddies and walk home and it's like he gigs like four nights a week for like 50 years and he's it's just literally like, my dream dude yeah it's so <laughs> dope i'm just like wow oh, that's that's he's he's got life figured out you know? that's amazing is that that's in Tor toronto i uh, no, in ottawa my folks in ottawa in oh nice man. I, yeah, I, I was born ottawa. in toronto but i, I okay. lived in ottawa for, for i love ottawa yeah yeah it's a good time i mean i mean it was a great place to grow up because there wasn't a lot to do, but there was mm. lots of arts education funding. Mm -hmm. So everybody was very creative and very bored. And that's right. just like the perfect combination for high school. Like I think if I was if I had grown up in a city like LA or something, God knows what dumb shit I would have got into. But like right. I was just in the basement. It was cold outside, you know? It's just totally logging my hours, man, you know. That's rad. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's good times. But yeah, that's that's dope, man. What? Okay, so let's get back to you. Let's talk about okay. Tally Quelly because Tally Quelly is uh, by anyone's definition a, a rap legend. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you end up doing a record with Tally Quelly, and how the hell did that feel? Yeah, man. Um, it's kind of nuts, dude. Like you know, like like many people growing up in the '90s, like you know, I, I remember seeing Black Star play at like uh what was it? It was like Vans Warp Tour, I think, <laughs> growing up. And like, I was really, I was honestly mostly a punk rock kid, but like the conscious hip hop shit was just like really speaking to me. Um, well, and conscious hip hop was a bit punk in its way. Cause I mean, yeah. like, the pressure from the industry is like, oh no, we make rap music so that white kids can piss off their parents. So we need you to be a scary racist stereotype as much as possible kind of, and yeah. let's sell the records. And then like, you know, the conscious hip hop, which is like, you know, just keeping it so much more real and resisting all that industry pressure and all about thinking for themselves and challenging authority and shit. Yeah. I just this punk rock. Yeah, it kind of was. So maybe, maybe that's why it was on the Vans Warped Tour or whatever that one year that I saw them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, man, like I, uh, I met him just also like just random shit, man. So after I did the Bonobo hit, I mentioned earlier, Bonobo at that time was managed by the same guy who managed uh, pretty lights. Um, Wow. and um that guy knows what he's doing yeah no no he's 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 the man over at, over at it's read read at, at um red light um entertainment and uh he remembered me from the bonobo thing and derek was playing on conan o'brien's show he put out that that album color map of the sun which was like yeah. probably his most adventurous record you know ever well, i was they like made all the samples from scratch for that exactly one. That yeah really and uh he was playing fun. on conan o'brien and he needed a trumpet player and um this was before he even had like the pretty lights live band you know with like um so this was like maybe the first incarnation of the, the live band for conan o'brien to play uh the lead single off a color map of the sun which was around the block with talib um so i flew down to la and did like a day of rehearsal with you know like it was like eric krasno on guitar and boram lee um you know Derek, who was also like a musical hero of mine <laughs> and yeah, like, and Talib was there like rehearsing, you know, and then 
we did the show the next day. So over like two days of just like being in a rehearsal facility, um, you know, talking to him a little bit about like music and shit, like, you know, uh, we, we perhaps bonded, but at the very least he just knew who I was when like years later I wrote, wrote, wrote to him, you know, cause I think that was, that was, a, he remembered that, you know, I wasn't just some yeah. random dude like, Hey, you want to flow on my, and he also probably remembered me telling him about like how, how I wasn't really a hip hop kid. And I, and I really like how, like the conscious shit really spoke to me. And, um, and so I actually literally made a list of MCs that I wanted to work with. Um, uh, cause I don't, I don't really work with vocalists too much. And like, if I'm going to work with a, with a vocalist, typically for me, at least, um, I often want it to be an MC type of thing because like I'm the melodies I'm, I'm like writing the melodies. So I'm kind of thinking about the vocal more like a rhythmic thing that yeah, fits that in with sense. the melodies, you know, rather than like, here's the top line, which, which is cool. Like, and I guess I have done that and I, I plan on working with vocals in the future, but like, I knew I wanted to work with some MCs and I had a list um, of MCs and it was like a gift, a gab. Um, oh, he's so great. So yeah, great. it was, it was gift, a gab. Um, and, um, um, handful of other cats and, and Talib Kweli was literally at the top of, of this list, just like physically that I wrote down. So he was like, just the first person I reached out to on this list. And, uh, and he, he remembered me and, and he liked the beat that I made. It was this track IMO that ended up on the grammatic record. He liked the beat and, and, uh, he, he gave me like a really reasonable, um, um, you know, how it works. Like typically you give, you give people advances. So he, he gave me like a really reasonable, um, advance, uh, that's cool because he he could charge an unreasonable he could have charged an unreasonable amount. It. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it was like four thousand dollars or something like that, which which is probably a lot lower than than he would That's charge just like a way more affordable. Than I want it was more literally, I think, like, well, I got to hire the dude at the recording studio, and like, like it was more just like a transactional thing, just to like not trip about it when he goes and records, you know, um, rather than like a fee. It was it definitely wasn't a fee because he owns part of the song and all that. Um, it was it was just a small advance. Um, but, but also on the flip of that, like it was only because I was DJing weddings that I had $4,000 that I could like, absolutely. I'm going to spend on this, you know? So like, you know, that, that's an important thing to know, like to save money to like, and use it the best, honestly, in my opinion, the best place to use money is to hire amazing people. <laughs> like, I can't think yeah, it's I think better. A than lot of people will, will like, they'll blow their money on some ridiculous music video that like nobody watches that they spend right. so much money on. It's just this fucking a masterpiece, just like sitting on YouTube with like 500 plays and like yeah. no, one, no one going to. But if you get the right remixer or the right collab or whatever, that is like, that's like planting a seed that is going to grow into all different kinds of relationships. And it's just going to mean that your name is coming up again and again and again. Whereas like, you know, a music video doesn't, it just doesn't start that much of a conversation unless right. it's like, unless it's like you got Chris Cunningham on the job or like Spike right. Jones or something. It's like, you totally. know, it's better, better be a world class. Like they're, yeah there have been some pretty good music videos over the years, you know, like Dude, it's, it's hard to rock people's socks with the music. You, did video. you see the little Nas X video that just came out last week? No, but I, I love oh. the sneaker thing. I've been chuckling about Dude. it all day. I'm like, this guy got his worst enemies to be his free promo. Like yeah. how amazing. You got to check out the video. It's, 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 it's like the best thing I've, I've, I think it's like, it might be my favorite music video of all time. Really? He just okay, came out. Yeah. Check it out. It's, it's mind blowing. And he, he plays all the roles and it's like, you know, anyone who was like, oh, like I, I knew some, you know, like, uh, you know, middle-aged white women that like, oh, I can get down to Old Town Road. That's a fun little jig. I, I still haven't heard it. I've been, I've been, I've been like trying not to hear it because I've you've never heard, heard Old Town Road. You, I've heard it's one of those ones that you can't unhear. You can't unhear. I, I have lots of lots of my friends who are like, I'll never be able to unhear that, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I got to tell you, man, it's kind of it's kind of a dumb song, Old Town Road. But I will tell you. This and this this is something that I think a lot of artists do. They make kind of a dumb song that like gets some attention, and then it's like a gateway drug to like serious art. Well, like you know? Bauer, for example, is like one yes. of my favorite producers, and Harlem Shake is by no means his best work. No, yeah, and 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 like I know like Sly and the Family Stone, who's like a you know Bay Area band heroes of mine. Like they they put they, they literally 
like one of their biggest hits um uh on their record you know um uh, on the record stand was like intentionally written just to like like have people sing along and dance to it's like you know all we need is some rhythm, right? Like da 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 da. And then like the B sides on that record are like so out there. And like like I was talking to um to Sly Stone's brother Fred Stone because he lives in the Bay Area, and he's like, yeah, you know, like we were like really insistent that we put like if we're gonna put the pop stuff on there, we have to put like the weird stuff to like to potentially like convert convert people into yeah, like becoming it's, it's hippies like, basically your, your job as a musician is basically to like trick people into having better taste in music than they do <laughs> right <That's, laughs> you know? yeah like, uh, the old the old bait and switch you know which is yeah. an art you must learn at a wedding dj you've oh, got to yeah. like achieve critical mass before you can play anything you want to play you've got to achieve yeah achieve man. critical mass yeah the floor totally man and i gotta i gotta say like i actually have like a shitload of respect for like great wedding DJs. i was just watching there's a master class with um with quest love from the roots and like like almost a third of the video he's talking about djing weddings and he's still to this day he doesn't need the money like like but he djs weddings like that's awesome and he loves it because it's like oh like he did a party for, i don't think it was a wedding but he did a party for jay-z and beyonce and he was just talking about like how like he spent like four hours a day like thinking about like how to do all these transitions and like to like tie into like like all these B sides that maybe Jay Z referenced on his own albums and all these you know samples that Beyonce might have referenced That's and then so and then dope. grabbing the other tracks from like those records that they sampled because it's like you know if they if they sampled that one song they probably like these other songs from those records so he like grabbed all these things that are like kind of abstracted from the realities of Jay Z and Beyonce and then made a wow. set tying all those kind of B sides together. And that's DJing. That yeah. is the art of DJ. Totally. Right there. And I, I gotta say, it is like it is definitely um a kind of a, a dying uh art, you know. It's like all these these DJs that you see a lot of the time are producers who are known yeah. as music producers and maybe don't have like a very deep knowledge of music history or whatever, and they'll play like their hit and then like all the same other current hits that everyone else is playing only yeah. like for two or three tracks it's like their turn to play their hit totally. you know and then you well, see someone like z trip or quest love or jazzy jeff live and you're just like oh my god this is like a freaking, completely different art freaking history lesson with those guys you know yeah and jazzy jeff man like i remember seeing him at, like I, I always catch his set at shambhala every year and i remember mm. seeing him and he had like he was doing like these mixes where everything was like perfectly inky and then it was just like he would play like 20 seconds of a record and then into 20 seconds of another record and 20 seconds of another record which normally would get annoying because you can't right. get your dance on but the structure of like he would have like a whole five minute section that he might have played 20 records in it but that five minute section makes sense as a song. And like, he'll have like, you know, this song will reference the fact that it's Friday and then so will this song and so will that song. And then it'll be midnight and then there'll be lyrics about Saturday or whatever. And then that chunk is done. You're like, that was a whole weekend in like five minutes of mixing. It's just insanity, you know? And then he's just oh, like, he's like really blase about it. Just like, ah, oh, whatever, just hanging out in VIP, just super chill. Like, how's your weekend going, dude? You know, like yeah. all night, everybody was like, that now that is a DJ. That is a specimen right there. Totally, yeah. man. No, and and it, it's I think it's so cool that Shambhala like books so so many different types of music. Like, I think I think for me, like I think one of the reasons why. Um, so I'm getting like a tiny bit tipsy. I was, this was all like whiskey, oh, dude, Japanese whiskey. So I'm, I'm actually. Oh, that was. I see. I stopped drinking, but that was my shit. Was oh, so so which good. one? Which one is it? Oh man, what is this? Hold on one sec. Tiki whiskey is pretty good. Oh, this is this is exciting. So for those of you who don't know, um, Scotch is predominantly a Scottish game, but is it the Hijiki? What is it? Oh, Hibiki. Hibiki, that's what it was. Yes, that's a good one. That's a good you know one. one. I had actually mentioned it. I just accidentally called it Hijiki and not Hibiki on the way out. But yeah, that's that stuff is it's so more. good. That stuff Sorry. is so good. Just a um, little bit. I'm not. I'm not actually drunk, but yeah. Way. Even just even the bit. even like hardcore like Scotland forever Scotch people will totally give it up for Japanese whiskey. And like there was a period where 
they just basically took over and they were winning all the world scotch championships for a long mm. time. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what the current status is as I'm, I'm actively avoiding scotch, but <laughs> holy moly, did I ever like that stuff? Man, I, I remember the I'm first sorry. time I got introduced to Japanese whiskey. Um, I was in Japan in like a, a suburb uh, uh, in the north of Tokyo where I found a like relatively inexpensive by Tokyo standards place to, to, to stay. It was like a little like, like three tatami room, you know, mm. like super tiny, like basically a closet. Like you put out the mats and sleep and then fold them up because it, it's all, that's all there is room for there. And I had a uh, jet lag and um, my wife and I were like, okay, let's just like go find something to do. And we went out and there was this like little tiny hole in the wall, like, like restaurant underneath our, the, the, the hotel that we were staying at. So we're like, oh, we'll go in there. And it's just like, you know, it looked like this tiny little dive bar from the outside. So I'm like, okay, well, whatever, you know, like, well, we'd go check it out. And we came in and the, the bartender was like, just immaculately dressed. Mm. Like, just like, and it was like, it was like, a, you know, like not the fanciest looking place, but the, the guy's attention to detail of this fashion really should have been my first clue what I was given, getting myself into here. But I was just a totally ignorant tourist or whatever. And I was like, yeah, let's get a shot of whiskey. So I, I go up to the guy and I'm like, hey, guys. You know, can I can I get a shot of whiskey? He's like, oh, you try Japanese whiskey. I'm like, no, no, whatever. You know, I'll get, give it a shot. And then uh, he's like, uh, he goes to pour pour it, and he's like, uh, on the rock. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, on the rocks. You know, it's pour. He's like, no, no, on the rock. And I'm like, no, you you mean on the rocks? You mean on the rocks? Totally confident in my ignorance. And he was like, no, I mean on the rock. And I'm like, okay, sure. And then like suddenly all this like these noises happen and like steam shoots out and the guy turns around with this perfectly spherical crystal ball of fucking ice that was like made in a machine that makes these like perfect crystal spheres of ice with not a drop in it. And then he just delicately pours this fucking precious golden liquid over this oh like sphere and it cascades in the cup and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then I had a, a sip and it was just like fucking like fireworks and fucking like just you could taste the earth and the wood and the smoke. And it was just this like rainbow of fucking flavors and stuff. And I was just like, I'm such an idiot. I was so ignorant trying to correct this guy. And it was on the rock and like assuming this was like some shitty ass. And then I look around, and I realized that everyone in there is like, super rich and like all the furniture is like really fucking nice and uh and it was and it was a good thing my wife didn't want one because they were fucking 50 bucks american oh my god but holy shit that whiskey was good and oh on the gosh. rock is not a, not a mistake on the rock is the on best the rock. decision you've ever made man if we ever make another collab we gotta call it on the rock <laughs> on, i'm down i'm down <laughs> yeah we gotta do it we gotta do it for real Love that. uh cool so um uh, that Talib Kweli tune went on to do some big things. Yeah, man. It's kind of wild. About that. Yeah. So like grammatic, like, like worked on it too, which was cool. Like Talib was down and was like, yeah, sure. We can do another version on, on this artist that has like millions of followers album. Sure. Why not? <laughs> um, he's like, I'll still own part of it either way. Um, so yeah, grammatic basically did his version of it, which, and it's kind of cool. Cause like normally, normally that would have been kind of released as like a remix or something. Cause he basically took what we did and just like made it his own. Um, but it was cool. Cause like, I was like, Hey man, like I'm down to do that. But is it cool if I still release like my version too? And he's like, yeah, we'll like do like, and this never happens. Like literally you rarely see this. He's like, yeah, we can do like, like the grammatic version. And then you can do like the original mix version. So instead of it being like a remix, it was just like grammatic and bulk and bump. And then just like bulk and bump. Um, so anyway, we, we did that on, on his record. Uh, we toured the shit out of that record. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that song ended up getting picked up by uh, by Porsche for their Super Bowl ad. I don't know if that's what you were getting at. But like, oh, yeah, that's what I was getting at. That, that's that like, was, uh, that's uh, man, that must have felt good. It's wild. I mean, the timing couldn't have happened any better because, like, as, as many musicians, like, this entire year, I mean, it was basically a year of income, to be honest with you, that, like, I like quite frankly like didn't have <laughs> yeah it wasn't oh, for dude, this. we all we all had to roll with the punches in 2020 it was so, like, not pretty it's kind of like wild that that happened um once again like just like also one of these things that like you can't you can't like uh you can't make something like that happen 
you know what I mean? Like, like, like having a song and a Super Bowl ad, I was thinking about it because I, I hit them up. I was like, Hey, how did you find my music? Like, blah, 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 blah. Like I was trying to figure out how that happened. I thought it might've been some handshake You're deal, like, between. we like expensive things. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe one of grammatics, like managers knew someone and like took someone out for dinner. Like who, like shit like that happens, you know? Um, but apparently at that level, like things like that don't happen because there's so much money on the table. Like they're spending like millions of dollars to place the ad that they're going to have the song that they, that the director just wants to have. It's like, it's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. You can't pitch your music for to Quentin Tarantino. Like he'll use it if he wants to use it. And if he doesn't, he won't like, they'll, they'll find you. It was one of those moments. Yeah. Like, like, cause I, I have like a music publisher. I have people like pitching my music for things and like, like, like you, you can't, you can't pitch it for something like that. They just find you if they like your music. So I don't know, maybe someone was on tour and heard it. And then they were like, Oh, it worked out perfectly. Cause like the hook is Talib saying, let's go. And it's like a drop right when the car speeds off in like the, the ad. Um, so like it actually, like, I, I actually was like, man, if I was scoring a Porsche ad, I certainly would like not think to use my own music, to be honest. Like I would probably write something new or work on someone else's song. But like, when I saw the ad, I was like, oh, this was like, <laughs> this so, really so did, did work. Did, did you, uh, you watched it live during the Super Bowl. Uh, who'd you watch the Super Bowl with? Um, fu- <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> like you would think that I would have been able to watch it, but I actually had a show that day. I was playing a gym oh. and jam music festival in, in Arizona. <laughs> so that's, I watched that's cool though. You know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I, I would take a gig over the Super Bowl too, you know, cause I knew it was going to happen, you know, like whether I watched it or not, but, um, I did. I, I watched it with my buddy Teddy, who's from Phoenix area, uh, Tucson. Uh, we were in that area for the festival, so we went to some of his friends' house before we had to leave, and we were hoping the ad would come on before we had to take off, but it it didn't. So we watched like the first quarter, and then had to do the festival. Um, and then I, my my you know my Instagram was like people were like, oh, hey, is that your song? You know, it's yeah, kind of it, that always feels good when you're like doing something else and then you check back and you're like oh i did something big while i was doing something else that's like one of my favorite feelings about being i love that feeling and it's so funny because it happens a lot of music right where like people i don't know if you get this ever like people like oh my god congratulations about this thing that's happening and you're like you're like whoa like i totally forgot like i did that like you forgot like it's it's a waiting (laughs) period right (laughs) i signed an nda like a year ago about that (laughs) yeah Totally. Um, yeah. Oh, NDAs are so, so funny too. When you're under NDA and you're just like, especially when things will come up that are like so relevant and you're just sitting there and you're like, I can't fucking say anything yeah. about this. I can't even let them know I have an NDA. That's the totally. whole point of the NDA. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, they're funny. I'm just drinking water now. That's good. It's good. It's important to stay hydrated. Yeah. No, it's a little warm down here too. So yeah it's um it's starting to warm up here i was outside in the sun today like mm. running around in a park full of dogs and oh it's just it's so great yeah man. It's spring just, is here yeah it's it's rad it's mm. rad i mean i really want to just like you know book a whole run of shows and go across the border and go party and play with all my friends but man i don't get back until fucking june it's it's taken forever up here because they had to get the vaccine from Europe because they were mm. worried about America first might mean no vaccine for you, Canada. So they had to uh, they had to source their vaccine from Europe. And now now America's like, oh, you've been waiting so long. Here, have some of the AstraZeneca stuff. We're, we don't want that shit anyway. <laughs> so, so they're they're so my grandma's vax and my mom and dad are Good. vax, but I gotta I gotta wait. Yeah, um, I'm 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 excited though. I'm excited. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll happen. happen. And it seems like it seems like my brain. It seems like most of the festivals and touring isn't really happening until like late summer, fall anyway. Yeah, so. they just announced no Shambhala today. I was, doing it. <laughs> but I saw that it would have been my first Shambhala. I, was like, oh. I mean, I mean, last year would have been my first. I was booked, but like, I think that I think that it'll roll over to 2022. I guess I hope. I, I, I mean, I just got to stay relevant as an artist until then for no other reason. I, I, yeah, it's, it's worth doing whatever you got to do to make it on that lineup. That right. is the festival. I've played a lot of festivals. And one year I did 19 in one year. And that was wow. still, that still is the best one. It is really, really epic. Yeah. Like it, and when you come, 
come for the whole weekend. Like, don't take any other gigs. Okay. I made that mistake one time and I was like, they just drove a truckload of money up to my house. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. I'll risk the staying up all night and flying and stuff. And it's just like, no, you, you stay the whole weekend and just hang out in the artist lounge, meet everybody. And like some, some of my best business connections came out of that festival while mm-hmm. I was having like the most fun of my entire That's what life. it's all about. And like, it's just so productive and so fun and just, just magic. And like, I remember the first year that I ever went, this was while well, we was still naughty in Canada. I remember that there was this, I remember on Monday, I saw this like big, cause it was, it was later in the year back then. It was like, um, it was like in the, like towards the end of August. And I remember this mm. tree stump with this huge, budding weed plant in the tree stump and it was in like a fairly obvious place and it was like you know like if you it was a little early but if you picked it and dried it out like you would have free weed and I remember there was like 15,000 people there for the whole weekend and like nobody fucked with that weed plant and I was just like wow that's like and this this was in like 2003 maybe wow I was just like damn this place is special man like that is special well-behaved crowd yeah meanwhile like that is a well-behaved crowd meanwhile like electric forest like people are like picking up pills and porta potty like floors you know like i don't know what this will do but a five hour (laughs) rule exactly yeah man man. that's hilarious it's a it's a drug-free festival technically right or alcohol-free festival it's alcohol-free okay yeah, it's not everybody knows there's going to be drugs there. Like there, okay. and they have they have harm reduction, they have drug testing. They That's have, awesome. Like, you know, there's yeah. So it's like, you know, they, they there's no nobody has any illusions about it being drug free, but it's, okay. it is definitely alcohol free, and that is I think where a lot of the good behavior comes from. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's an alcohol free festival and no sponsors ever, which I think is really really cool. That's um, amazing. Yeah, it's it's super special. Like I saw Gift of Gab there. Uh, they had the people under the stairs play one year. That was Sick. I never thought I'd get to see them. Um, they, you know, and like just so many awesome acts. And they'll book like they'll book rap acts. They'll book, you know, like sometimes they'll have like like circus acts and stuff, and like so, you know all kinds of different things. It's just super special, man. Super super special. So <sighs> hopefully, wow. hopefully twenty twenty two. Uh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go hard and uh, and we'll we'll rendezvous there and rage it uh, DC super style. Super excited! Yeah, super it's, excited! It's, so so um um what are what are you uh, working on now? Anything exciting that you can tell us about, or do yeah. I have to sign an NDA? <laughs> nice. Um, that was your uh, your NDA music. Now you're nice. Okay, so you're all under NDA. The you're magic all under of NDA. Um, piano NDA. <laughs> uh no um so i'm actually like on thursday i'm leaving for an 18 day permaculture design course in nevada city i'm going to be living on a farm for 18 days off the grid um like planting learning about herbalism learning about like sustainability sustainable agriculture all sorts of things and i i'm really excited about that um one of the teachers is ryan rising who's like organized um um, Polish ambassadors, like permaculture tour. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, he's like Mr. Permaculture and he's, yeah. there, so I, you know, he's involved. Totally. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about, cause I, I I'm a like an avid gardener and everything, but I'm, I'm excited about like thinking, you know, cause I, I think one of the things about COVID is like, it's easy for us all to be like, Oh, I can't wait to get things back where I'm touring and back to normal. But I also think like, man, there was actually a lot of things wrong with like what was going on before, like, you know, on a lot of levels, like, 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 you know, like, like, uh, as an example, there's such an underrepresentation of like women and people of yes. color on a lot of these stages, you know, Big and, time. and like Big on top time. of and, that, and like, I, I think I'm going to risk being not PC here. And, and I think I'm going to go on a limb and may, maybe I'll get canceled, but I'm going to take a risk and say it anyway. I think women have better taste in music. Yeah. I mean, I think, they I think do. the women in my life certainly it's, do. It's just a fact. They do. I mean, it's hilarious. Like my, 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 uh, my partner, girlfriend, uh, she, she sees right through all the fucking hype man. like, she'll hear a beat of mine. And she'll be like, it's like, man, it doesn't really sound like you or like, nah, like that's a little too aggressive. Like she just, she hears it for what it is. She, she they doesn't, she, she doesn't care if it's like some trendy sound that I'm trying to adapt that I'm all proud no, of. Like she doesn't don't care. care about that. Is it good or not? <laughs> like just right to the chase, yeah. right to the chase. It's great. 
Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would be doing without my wife in my life, but it would be nothing good. Nothing yeah. good would would be going on. No, it's... but um, yeah, there's that, and then like also like just like the, the you know like the the like just the carbon footprint of touring. Like I've, I've I feel with real guilty about that. You know, like I I did fucking like eight flights a week for like almost like i think probably 15 years i was touring like that wait 50 just, years aren't you like yeah 50 years yeah, 35 so yeah i just i actually uh sleep upside down and i drink the blood of um fetuses every night just stem cells just suck it out yeah no um no 15 years i did oh, almost like almost 15 years just being on the road all wow. the time and yeah and for about 10 of it it was like three gigs a week and i just like I think about that now and I'm just like that is so many flights like that's just it's just, a lot, yeah yeah it's and it's just terrible like this is one of the worst things you can ever do as, as like as as like for the environment it's like yeah one of I the mean worst things ever yeah I mean like eating eating meat apparently and I do eat like hamburgers once in a while but like eating hamburgers <laughs> like really bad too so that's you terrible. can counterbalance it but like you know so like part of the reason I want to do this permaculture retreat is because like you know, if I, I'm kind of thinking like, man, like I, I'm looking at what Polish ambassador did there. And I'm like, man, that's kind of a cool concept, like taking a tour, but like actually going into a community and like planting trees. And like, if I'm going to drive out somewhere, like doing something that's like, that's really like that, that not only like maybe, uh, cancels out well not cancels out, but like offsets some of the carbon emissions, but also like plants, like if we could plant like extra trees, you know, and like, and empower communities to be like more off off the food agriculture rig where they're not getting things in plastic all the time so you think about it like man you know you get like you get like chives at the grocery store like really all like a chive really is is like the green part of an onion like you can just chop that up and they'll regrow and regrow and regrow like it doesn't need to come in like you can grow it on your windowsill you know like it's so a lot of these things are so easy so I can't even tell you how many people that have come to my workshops or come to the dojo from these music schools going, hey, Dylan, I just spent 50 grand and like a year plus of my life learning what all these knobs do, but I can't finish music. And that's why, you know, my specialty as an educator is teaching workflow because workflow is a full process where you can cross the finish line again and again and again and get better step in my dojo you step in my step in my dojo you step 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 in my dojo you we all want to make high quality music Right. That's the name of the game. You want to make the best possible music you can. Um, what what five plant five edible yeah. plants? What are your top five edible plants? Okay, five top edible plants. Okay, most of them are perennial herbs. And I and I and I say this because they'll they'll regrow. You can use it in all sorts of food. They're fairly easy to grow, um, and also very drought tolerant. So like also that means neglect tolerant. You know, you can leave them in the sun without watering them a lot. Um, so like like rosemary, uh thyme. Um, also like mints are really amazing. Cause you can, you can put them in drinks to spice up your water. Um, they do need a little bit more water. Um, but they also grow like crazy and then you can like divide them and give like little chunks of it to friends and like, here's some mint, take it, put it on. Um, and then chives are amazing. And you can just put, you can do literally all you have to do. You can buy or, on, you know, onions or green onions, whatever you want to call them, get them at the store, chop off the top part, take the bulb, put it in, 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 in a, a little soil in your window water it like it'll grow back you can cut it'll regrow cut regrow mm-hmm. cut all you can do it about four times a season i, I so cook you, all the time like i'm, I'm really big yeah cooking and i just uh yeah there's definitely especially too like herbs are so expensive and they're never really that fresh and exactly stuff. That's what, yeah and then okay, the other so one rosemary we got thyme i mint we got chives, we chives. Got mint. what's your and number then, five and then, you know, if you live in a warmish climate, I would say tomatoes, just because they're like, they really are better off the vine. Like by the time they get to the store and sit in a, in a refrigerated area, by the time it gets to you, like, um, I mean, unless you have like, if you have a really choice farmer's market where they're picking it like yeah. that morning, they're made, but the taste there, is just something. Isn't there like some enzyme get. or something that is like lost really quick? Once yeah, the vine and that's there is. On the vine. 
maybe after after this permaculture retreat, I'll know the name of the inside, but yeah, there's okay. there's something. And that's true with like well, garlic is in um its shell, but like when you peel garlic and crush it, when you crush it, it loses its nutrients in like 15 minutes or something crazy. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of things like that. Like you want to like, but other things gain but nutrients so if, when you cook if you it. chop it, does that happen? Is this is this specific to crushing or is it just the fact that it's in I think, uh, I think it probably does it slower with fewer cuts, but like it releases yeah. some sort of like aromatic, you know, medicinal essence that, 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 um, doesn't get into your body. Um, if, if you wait too long, you know? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things like just fresh things like, um, weed is another really good one. Like if you do smoke, it's just so much more, um, it's kind of a beautiful process to like grow your own plant and like, and smoke it and like give it to friends. Like if it's, yeah, you, know, if it's legal, you can grow six plants in Canada now. It's you can like, go that's here it. too in California. Yeah. It's awesome. And like, and it, it really, even if it's not like the greatest like production in the world, it's still pretty good. And, and, uh, you don't have to like, you know, go awkwardly wait in a line and show someone your ID and then like get in a little bag and with all that plastic once again. And then like, yeah, you know, it's yeah, kind I, of amazing. I remember, uh, I, there was one time I was at a place in California and it was like a, a juice bar and they, you know, it wasn't on the menu, but they had, uh, they had like been putting weed stems in the juicer mm. and they had like a grass juicer and they, they put some weed stems in it. And I was like, that is tasty. And they were like, yeah, it's like, it was oh. like, you know, it's like extra CBD or whatever. They said, they were like, oh. do you want extra CBD juice? And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, we've got some stems. We're going to juice it. And it was, good man that's it awesome like really tasty yeah, yeah so i kind of like i get a norwalk like i juice all the time with my norwalk and i've been i've been oh, fantasizing about juicing juicing weed stems i had no idea man like i just gave them to my buddy i think he made like shake out of it or he made like a he made something with it but so i remember people good, doing tea well you know people where you can boil the yeah. stem like tea but uh yeah but yeah huh. I, I gotta do that cool okay so um uh i noticed that you've got all kinds of musical instruments around you. Hmm. Uh, I was, yeah. hoping, uh, this is, this is like a crazy idea here that I think okay. might be a fun way for us to, to get to know who's, who's out there watching slash listening to this. Yeah. interview. I was kind of hoping that you might want to pick up the trumpet and sure. play us a little something. And then maybe people in our, 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 our listenership slash viewership could, could sample and remix it. Absolutely. I'm going to put a tiny little verb on my mic. Oh, wow. I love how he's just like on tap. He's just, he's just, he's got reverb, like just on tap. Like, <laughs> okay. Like... okay, cool. Sick. All right. I can't wait. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet. I'll turn my mic off. Okay, real, real quick. Actually, before you go, let me, what's, what, what's the tempo that you want? Um, whatever yeah. you're feeling, man. I mean, okay. I think all genres of, of people listen to, listen to here. So yeah, just, uh, Did just I, maybe I'll do little... it. Maybe I'll do it to a click, you know, that way, that way folks can kind of, wow. he's, he's going you know. all in this, this man cares about you out there. You dear, know what I mean? Your listener, dear viewer. Well, I also care about myself and, and if they get it and it's not to a click, they might like try to warp it in a weird way and put awkward transients. Sure. Sound quality, sound quality is a thing, you know? Um, so if it's intentional, by all means do that. But if you want it to just be at the right tempo, I'm just going to put this at a hundred a nice middle ground and i'm gonna put okay cool I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute my mic so that uh, i don't contaminate our fabulous recording i think i'm getting so i just need to go into live and set my output to my headphones there we go okay and what i'll do is I'll also are you i'll record this like in hi-fi in ableton and i'll send it to you and then if someone wants it oh super sick even better even or maybe better. i can even like upload it somewhere like a public link you know oh this is so great okay and then um uh if you uh remix this and it's awesome and amazing we can talk about maybe putting it out but um if you yeah so this is this is, this is exciting okay i'm gonna mute
Yo, that was magic. That was so cool. That was, uh, yeah, I could tell you've done that once or twice in your life. Never, never like on me to do that. There, now we're recording again. I didn't even know I could okay. do that. <laughs> cool, but, but you got you got the the, the, the goods, right? The goods. The, yeah, the, I got that recorded. Oh, this, um, is gonna, this is gonna be so fun because there's a lot of really good musicians out there, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure they're they're listening and, uh, and yeah. Okay, cool. So so yeah, very cool. Um, just um, uh, yeah, definitely uh, send it back our our way and uh, be sure um, be sure to tag. Uh, Balkan bump and ill gates when you post your uh, be fun. I love that your, your tune. Uh, oh, I'm I'm so super excited. I love the way that mute sounds too. That's like yeah, that's not like the Miles Dave. I mean Miles just like he defined the sound of this harmon mute. Um, but uh, but I, I love it, and it's one of those things where like I I can practice it when someone like my girlfriend uh, is in law school in the other room, so I can like I can play it, but it still has a beautiful tone, but it's not too loud, so it won't upset anyone. Yeah, I'm I'm always amazed when someone's like a drummer from Brooklyn or something. I'm always like, how did you do that in an apartment? Like, did you did you build yourself a cement box? Like totally. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, what was any any tips for um, uh, avoiding noise complaints? Oh, like for trumpet players and stuff like that. Um, yeah, or just anyone who's loud. Any tip for our loud audience members how to avoid noise? Yeah, complaints? honestly, man. Like, I really think this is true. Like. It's almost like the louder your instrument is, the more dynamic range you actually have. Um, and a lot of times people that play loud music, like don't explore like that minutia. I think about it like this, like, uh, you might appreciate this. I mean, you probably already talked about this, but like, um, with, uh, with producing, right. Like by default, Ableton or any software, it's set to zero DB. Right. And you can go up to six in Ableton, but you can go down to infinity. Like that knob will go. So you have so much headroom going down. <laughs> yeah. And actually not that much going up is the no. truth. And most commercially produced sounds are already just bricked. Like it's just this right. sausage of zero dB loudness, totally. you know? So it, it turns out actually like practicing quieter um, and as quiet, almost as quiet as you can to still get the integrity of the feeling, like actually like gives you more, um, more volume range and more um uh subtlety and nuance on your instrument and in the studio like 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 you can do actually more <laughs> with it when it's sometimes when it's i mean that that's not, not to say sometimes i'll just play super loudly and it shows i dig the fuck in but like like it's probably better practicing quiet like as far as like just like improving on your instrument like it's probably i probably get more out of playing quietly than i do out of oh, playing super loud that's a great tip yeah that's, that's really good that was uh that was not the answer i was expecting but it was definitely the answer i yeah. needed yeah cool. and so, other... um, okay <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask you about um some other tips but one, yeah. one question about tips that i often ask people is if you had a time machine that could only teleport back information what would you <laughs> tell yourself in the past to spare yourself some hassle and speed up your progress man it's a good question um I probably would tell myself how to build a time machine. Well, that's pretty <laughs> sick. That's definitely there. You go. You ever watch that movie Primer? <laughs> like the uh, realistic no. movie about time travel, and the plot is just completely impossible to follow because the movie happens like basically as soon as they invent the time machine, there's like 50 versions of themselves coming oh back, God. and you're like, yeah. oh fuck, fuck, what? And there's like you know message boards with theories about oh yeah, it's like literally the only realistic movie about time travel. Totally. So okay, so so now now <laughs> now that we've gotten the realistic answer out of the way, uh please give us a non-realistic fantasy answer that will yield useless or useful information for our audience. Yeah. Honestly, I probably would have just like told myself to like study with other music producers. <laughs> I was talking to you about this before the call. Like when I was a kid, like I was taking trumpet lessons, I was taking piano lessons and I was just like learning music production by myself. Like, I think it was like Sonar XL or some program like that. Oh, like, wow. Old school. Like, yeah. Like when I was in like freshman high school, like in 2000, 
And, uh, you know, like, like people that were producers were working at like million dollar studios, producing big records, like, like the idea of a home studio person, like the fact, like, I didn't know that, like, I could even study that with someone and like learn about producing, like really until like after college, like for a long time, I didn't realize that like they were, you know, and people like you like helped, helped actually like, like make that visible. Like, Hey, like I'm here to help you. Like, let's make your beats more awesome. Like, I didn't know that that was like a thing growing up because it wasn't yeah. really. You no, know? Well, well, that's why, that's why I was so compelled to, to create the, the dojo community is yeah. that I just like, I remember what it was like growing up where no one wanted to help me and everybody treated it this competition and they're all trying to like, you know, keep me out of the game. And I was yeah. just like, this is lame. Like, I want to collaborate. Let's make cool things together. Like, let's team up, you know? And I just thought it was such a bummer to be yeah. out there with all these people like, you know, just fighting over this slice of this pie. And I'm like, you know, you have a pie machine in your brain. You can totally. just make more pie. Totally. Exactly. And like, looking back, I'm like, man, you know, that era, that was actually like at the height in a lot of ways of like the whole acid jazz move. I mean, like you had like Mark Farina, like right, right at the same time, like making the oh, sickest, the sickest beats, like in San Francisco, just like 20 miles, 30 miles from where I was growing up, like mixing trumpet and hip hop and all these things that I was falling in love with. I didn't even know he was from the area. Like, like I probably would have told myself, Hey, like you love Mark Farina, like, like go, I know you're set 16 years old, but like have your mom, like drive you to his show and like hang out and like, like ask him if you can study with him yeah because like, i mean i get a lot of requests like, <laughs> that are like hey you know can you listen to my demo can you like um you know can can you uh hook me up with some famous person you know um you know can you do this can you do that can you do the other thing and you just kind of tune them out after a certain point but if someone's like you know I want to help you in some way that is meaningful enough that you will want to share your your knowledge with me. No one, you don't get that question very often. And that question, if you're like, Hey, look, you know, I want to know what you know, and I, I will work and help you to get that knowledge or pay you yeah. or whatever. If, if you approach a musician and ask that question, a lot of the time they are all fucking ears, you know, like it's totally. a, it, especially now too, like with all these artists and managers, like just eating toothpaste sandwiches, you know, like they, I don't loads of musicians who are making like 20 grand a week and are like fucking packing groceries right now. Like it's, it's, it's brutal. And like, yeah. if you're like, Hey, look, like I will help you run this management company that you're basically running as like a charity at this point, right. you know, help me, help me help you manage an artist. And then like, managers will be like hell yeah for sure and then now you know the people managing your favorite artists and now they like you you oh, know that goes, that goes such a long way like it, like how can i help and like you know i will help you in exchange for knowledge ask your favorite musicians that seriously because you would be surprised how open they are to the concept especially now yeah no it's really really true that's really good advice and like i think the fact that you like framed your program as a dojo is so hip like I just, I just don't like schools the whole like bulimic model of education where you're like regurgitate these facts there you go and now go out it's like dude the experience is so much more important than book learning with like especially with music like i know so many people have this like intensely like detailed academic knowledge of music and their music is boring or yeah. like they don't or unfinished yeah you know and totally. then you get kids who like they like don't even know that the notes have letters and they're making awesome music i, mean, I know, know it's wild like, man i know and i think i think that that's like that's like one of the things that i've been like really i think like focused on too is like in addition to like asking for help learning something from someone like also like and i kind of hinted at this earlier like hiring your favorite people to do shit you know yeah, big time like because like we're all we're all like, like beyond being, I mean, yourself, like beyond like everyone being like a touring musician or producer, like we're also like professionals and like, like if a good offer comes along, like we'll look at it. And if it seems oh. like a cool thing to be involved with, like, we'll, you know, typically 
people a lot of artists will will do it you know yeah oh for sure i did i did a lot of work for hire like remixes and stuff that are um and you know various other work for hire during covid yeah. man like it's been it's been really uh it's been really helpful you know yeah man and like like i like i hired like i'm like a i'm a I think I'm a pretty, like I, I mixed that the, the collaboration with Closey, I ended up mixing that and I feel really good about it. And I, I feel good about a lot of my mixes. Uh, you but mixed like, it. It's, I did. I, you know what? I didn't know you mixed it, which says a lot because Closey knows her way around a mix down. Oh, that does say a lot, you know? And, and I only, I only like, like called it finished because she was like, Oh, this is good. This is finished. I love it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. If you think it's good, then it's good. Um, but, um, a lot of my album, like I actually, like I hired my friend, uh, Vincent from the geek VRV to mix to like, he basically did like stem mastering because, um, by the time I was like pretty much finished with it, I was kind of fatigued of the whole thing. Um, to be honest with you, like I love once <laughs> it's my second time talking shit about my own record. I love it. But like, okay, I, I've I mean, been working on it. It's a full length record, you know, it's 14 songs. So like, I've been working on this for like four years. Like, um, so by the time it was kind of done and I wanted to mix down with, with the exception of Varshavar, um, the closey song, which I had already mixed and put out of the single. Um, I like, I was like, you know what? I want to have like someone who I really trust, just, just take it and make it, make it awesome. So that way I can move on and like start working some other shit or well, just take a break from music. You know, if you've been listening to the same track for like yes. over a hundred hours, you're kind of not hearing it so great. Exactly. And sometimes at that point, you honestly need to take a break. Like, maybe it's like best to just step aside and like, like for me, just go garden and like have fresh ears, hear it and like, you know, polish, polish it. Um, so anyway, like I, I'm all about like hiring, like, even if it's something that I can, can theoretically do myself, I think it's all about, it's really good to learn how to do things yourself. Um, but then sometimes you can hire, hire it out properly. And so that you can manage the person you've hired. out (laughs) Exactly. Like, like a lot of, like I hire, so yeah, I hire him sometimes to mix a lot of my music. To, it's kind of more like stem mastering. Like I mix it down with all my effects buses and everything. And he, he like just does the fine, the f- kind of like more subtle EQs and subtle compressions. And then like the, the mastering side of things. So, um, and I like that cause I, I like to be involved in like the creative aspects of mixing, but when it comes down to just like making everything perfectly have its space and making sure that the resonances like aren't phasing and all these things, I just like, it's just not, it's not really like, I can do it, but it's not really like what like super excites me. And and there are people, maybe yourself, like who are really excited about that. shit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find like if I have been hanging out with someone who's really into it and they get like super stoked about it and like, tell me about these different techniques that I get stoked about it. And then I want to like, then I want to do it, but there, totally. there are times when I'm just like, oh my God, this song has just been subtly different from itself. Just like this game of inches for like 10 sessions. And totally. like, am I making it better or worse? I don't even know anymore, you know? Yeah. And, and that's I, when it's know, good people, to have another chef in the kitchen. It's not over until the, the fat lady sings. And I, I always say the mix isn't over until you hate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> exactly there and, has you to know, be some point you're not pushing hard enough you didn't if you don't hate yourself totally. at least once during a mix down you you should probably be working totally man and it's gonna be so funny like after covid like going on the road because like typically i don't know about you but like typically i would have tested my tracks out on like on multiple stages me like, too but <laughs> before putting them out yeah <laughs> i know I'll, I'll sit on a track for like a lot of the time like multiple years of live sets like making slightly different versions and like testing it on pa and i'm like it's got to be like spontaneous audience screaming without me telling them to right and then I'm like okay they screamed it's a wrap you know but totally. like, if they're not if they're not like you know or, or like if you try an idea out in a set and people aren't like yo what was that you know, then I'm like, nah, he's still got still got work to do. They're asking about other tracks in that set, you know. Like, totally. You know, so. it's, it's like, yeah, you need that feedback. Cause I think like, you know, one thing that that really kind of was a big breakthrough for me was like, you know, when I was first starting, I was like, okay, you know, fuck what everybody thinks. I'm gonna be an artist. My art is for me. I'm going to like try and like be myself and, you know, only my ears count and like fuck what everybody thinks. I'm just going to be punk rock and stick to my own aesthetic and whatever, you know? 
and that there's a level at which that is great especially when you're trying to find a fresh style that mm -hmm. is like truly original there's there's definitely th something to be said for rejecting the opinions of others um but i've learned over time that your music is not yours to judge you know hmm. like the it's it's you got to do whatever you got to do to get through the creative process but when you put your songs out into the world they take on a whole other life that you know like like that song that you might have made as a joke might be someone's like alarm clock in the morning totally. and the thing that you thought was your masterpiece you might be the only person who ever really gives a shit about that song and it's like when it's so true. It's you so know true. over time when you do it a time and time and time again i think it's like we can't really strive like striving for perfection just manifests as procrastination and i just like now when i sit down i'm not trying to make something good because good just means something that sounds like my in influences you know so i find it more it's more useful to just try and make something that's like honest you know and that is like like an authentic expression of self and if i can do something that is both authentic and absurd you know right. i'm like this is this is like the craziest thing that i have to say about myself no one says this no one expresses himself in this way like this is this is cartoonish people are going to make fun of this this is ridiculous and if i can tick that absurd box while also ticking the honesty box yes that's when it's really good you know but it's like you got to kind of I don't know it's like you just you just have to let it happen you know and like stop trying to make it happen you know and just like just let it happen just let it come out let it be weird let it be oh. what it is and then you know and um, i i found that for me was a big big breakthrough you dude know? you're so right and like i think that's like you know, like, like I was saying, like, I kind of was making these Balkan trap beats kind of as a joke, to be honest, like the first beat I made was exactly what you're talking about. Like, it was a joke, like, like, actually, I made it because my friend Poldor, who's an amazing artist was in town, and his label head, it was his birthday that day. And he hated trap music, like he put out like instrumental hip hop albums, and this guy hated trap and it was coming up right then. So it was a joke, we made this like happy birthday trap beat and gave it to him on a cd so on his drive back home from dinner he could, he could listen to his birthday gift on a cd and that beat actually turned in Dude, that's love uh, right there that's pretty cool yeah, it's hilarious and we were rapping over it was terrible but there was this beat and that that the kick drum and the snare and all the production we did of that trap beat is what turned into the first balkan bump uh like that's kind of why i started messing around making trap it was like completely just to punk this dude who hated the music that's awesome <laughs> So That's it's so awesome. like, like exactly what you're saying. Yeah, man. That's, 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 I find too, like, uh, uh, like what got me, what got me out of the COVID slump because COVID, I was fucking depressed. Like I lost yeah. all my job touring. I'm a like new dad living in a fucking warehouse studio where I can't have people come work anymore. And like, I have no more touring income and homeless people are literally setting shit on fire with flames licking up the side of my fucking unit. And I'm oh. sitting there with my wife, my baby, and like years of work putting tentacles into this fucking building to set up all the studios. And I was just like, oh my God, I, I just don't feel like making party music for sound systems that are illegal to play right now. You know, and I was really bummed. And then like one of my homies, uh, he lives out in China and he has a heavy metal band and they're like, you know, they tour like China and Japan and stuff. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll pay you to do a fucking remix for my heavy metal band. And wow. I was like, okay, you know, fuck it, whatever. And I sat down and I was like, not writing music for a crowd. I wasn't writing music for a sound system. I was just writing music for my friend. Yeah. Because I love him, you know? And also because he was paying me, but the, I, you know, but it's like, it was motivated by love, the track, you know? And even if you're just writing tracks for like, like one person, you know, it's like that there's a real power in that, you know, and a way to just kind of like cut through a lot of the like bullshit blocks that we have. It's mm -hmm. like, 
write music for like one like maybe it's your fucking dog you know who knows but like if you write music for like one person that i think is a big hack like mm. if you're trying to write comedy music that's for one person you're just like so much of the crap that's stopping you from making music is just not relevant in that paradigm you know and then totally. out it comes and the next thing you know boom bulk and bump up in the super bowl baby i know it's so it's so funny yeah like i, I think that's really important to remember man i'm gonna like think about that actually when i'm because i'm starting to work in a lot of new music and i've had a similar slump this whole year a lot of ups and downs weeks when i'm super like in it and then months when like I haven't hit, you know, export from a session, you know, where it's just like, uh, um, but I think that's a really, I'm going to, I'm going to take that man. I'm going to take that and, and try to make, make songs for maybe individual people like, like my, my girlfriend and maybe my, my oh, mom. She would That'd be love cool. that. She would you know? love that. Yeah. And you know, it's like you're, you're in the house together all the time and stuff. It's like, you can't really go on like the craziest dates and stuff. And it's like, Hmm. It's important to let to let her know she's special, man. I I I, I fully support this 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 whole plan. I'm down. Okay. Love it. I'm well, down. I got yeah. Might, I'm gonna do that. It's a good idea. Um. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. Well, man, it's been it's been a pleasure being on being on your show and. This, yeah, this has been fun. This, this is, is easy. super this fun. Is like a really natural, just I know. Good fun. I wish and I you're, could like. You're a great interviewee. Thank you. I wish I could like reach over here and turn some of the knobs on your on your. uh modular sense hey some, someday someday soon <laughs> so, someday. Looks so fun man yeah the obelisk it's uh i it's a, it's a good time for sure wow it's just like blowing my mind i don't even stuff is like so so amazing <laughs> to look at yeah, well if you have you messed with vcv rack no vcv rack is a free software euro rack emulator okay and it's basically like you can there's even like because a lot of the best euro rack modules are open source so like this string synthesizer this oscillator this vca um and what other ones are there that are um oh yeah this delay all have perfect copies for free Whoa. On, on a vcv racket and vcv and you you patch it just the same as a modular, and you can you can set this like MIDI bridge from Ableton to send MIDI into it. And I actually will do like a lot of my patching. Like you can get it for free for iPad. I'll do a lot of time. I'll like try out a patch on the iPad or whatever, Whoa. and like do a bunch of different incarnations of it. And then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it over there. But if you wanna if you wanna get into to modular, there is a free way where like you know you can get used to you know probability sequencing and like you know gates and pitch streams and all that all those concepts are like oh yeah it's are all the free. gates are the gates ill or are they like they are they are as a matter <laughs> of fact yeah sick. <laughs> yeah it's a good time so check out vcv rack if you're, if i will you're, man that's so sick uh, were you like were you like a math kid growing up oh fuck no no really? okay. i hated math and i hated computers really yeah i was not into it at all and then, um, I, like I would all I like I would do drawing and like painting and photography huh. and stuff. Like I was I was in art school. I thought I was going to be um like a visual artist. And then I remember like I got I had to get a computer to do graphic design. And like I was just doing graphic design for this um this nightclub in Ottawa. And like I just you know I just ended up doing graphic design. I had to get a computer to do graphic design. But I like. It was really, I think it was like when I realized that I could hide horrifying images in my commercial graphic design work and then turn the flyers <laughs> upside down and show my friends and we would all be like rolling on the ground laughing at these like totally ridiculous pictures that I didn't, then I was like, okay, computers are kind of cool, you know, but That's before so that I was like, computers are for nerds, this is bullshit, you know, I was anti are you still doing shit like that in your music? Like, are there hidden messages like Beatles? Style? Uh, sometimes, yeah. And I mean, I definitely sample a lot of like household objects and stuff. Okay. And like, um, there's like, you know, a lot of just like recordings from my phone. Like my track Harmonica Lewinsky with Mr. Bill <laughs> in uh, Uber. And I was going to the airport and we got stuck in traffic. And the Uber driver just like turned the car off, didn't even ask permission to know I was a musician or anything we hadn't talked and he just turns the car off and starts playing harmonica in this like in this car and I was just like quietly got my phone out 
turned it on and recorded him. And he played harmonica for like two or three minutes. We we're getting ready to go over the Bay Bridge. And they finished. I was like, that was amazing. P.S. I recorded it. Can I keep the recording? And can I sample it for one of my songs? And he was like, sure, dude, whatever. Oh my God. You don't even have to credit me. I don't care. Like, go for That's it. Amazing. You know? and, I hope he's yeah. heard it. Yeah, I don't know. He didn't, he yeah, didn't give me name or anything. I gave him a good tip, though. I, I'm just picturing him, like, driving some other passenger, like, listening to Sirius FM, and the song comes on. He's like, this is my plane. He's super excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we cut it up into tiny pieces. Okay. So dude, by the way, Harmonica Lewinsky is well, so we're just good. I think of harmonica puns. That was the only one. Well, it's we it's also so good because it's like you literally blow and suck a harmonica. That's, like, how you play it. It's one of the only. <laughs> But I actually I watched that Monica Lewinsky TED talk and I felt a little bad about. That. I know. I mean, she's a she's an amazing woman who was like one of the first people that were cyber bullied. You know, like she was oh, like the totally. quintessential. And when you think about the power imbalance in that situation, like, yeah, I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah, He's the president. What are you gonna do? You're like 22. I would yeah. suck the stick. I'd be no, like, fuck. I, I I'll, I'll go to Guantanamo Bay if I don't suck the stick. Like, yeah, I know. It's the, yeah, so I, and, I did and, and feel I think, a little bad after watching yeah, the And I think had that happened, like now the narrative around it would have been very different. And I think she would have perhaps been like uh, respected a lot more by the media than, than she was. I, I have moment. a whole lot of respect for her now. Yeah. I really um, do. And I should have had a whole lot of respect for her all along. But uh, you but know, that name, you got to learn, a, you gotta learn when you're being a dick. And I know I that's a big part of life is learning, be, being being a big enough person to admit. I, know. I almost, I shouldn't even admit to this, but, but like you said, you have to admit when you're being a dick, I guess no one knows this. So I have no reason to admit to it, but like I, one of the names I was debating with Balkan bump was like, it's not even Balkan music. It's kind of a Borat type of thing where you take a random thing was Kurdish Mayfield. That's amazing. I, like, I know. I was like, oh, that's pretty Yo, you funny. Should, you you got to call a track Kurdish Mayfield. Kurdish yeah, I, Mayfield. I was getting ready for you to get to get canceled. Like I was getting ready <laughs> to, have to defend you on Twitter. But, dude, but, Kurdish Mayfield. It's kind of that's funny. incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> but it's like, you know, this was like when there was, I mean, there still are. It's like constant, like, like the Kurdish people are like one of the most like, like oh, they bullied. Have they have it so rough. Really and like, rough. like people, like so many nations are just like, like using force against like really innocent people who just want a home you know so it's kind of this awful situation that i'm like kind of like like making fun well, okay, so, so referencing <laughs> but, but the name that so people can get get intensely like because i i think it's fine to like you know if you're not being disrespectful to them which curtis mayfield like is an awesome musician yeah i, I don't think that there's any like comparing anyone to curtis mayfield is like he's he's super cool right yeah like, i would love to be like if you had some kind of pun about being like canadian and curtis mayfield i wouldn't be like on behalf right, of right. canada i'm right. deeply offended by that joke buddy totally like it's you can reference things you know it's just it's just being respectful whilst you do it that is totally and that's that's the thing and i'm, and I'm glad you point that out because like even balkan bump i've, I've kind of gone through because i'm not like my family and my dad's side's from like nearby the balkans in hungary but i'm like certainly not balkan by origin so i always you know, I, my, my attitude about it now, and, and if I could go back and rechange the name of the project, I probably would. But like, at the, at the end of the day, like, I think I, I'm really trying to like, show people all this music and like, like, just as like a geek, like, like you're talking about like a DJ, like, I'm just trying to like, here's all this amazing music, <laughs> like, check this shit out. Yeah, and I, like, I don't think you should worry about that. You know, name, dude. That's, so. uh, I think it's a great name. And I think it's also like, you know, you're, you're bigging up the music that has, has been so inspiring. Like, I think yeah. if you were like, no, I'm. I, I this music just magically came out of me with no precursors whatsoever. I think that would be problematic. But like, totally you know, acknowledging where it comes from and digging up the source, I have. I think that's fine, dude. Yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I, I hope that like you know a couple people on this podcast uh, check out some of the artists that I mentioned earlier, like Jombo and Boban Markovic and Goran Bergovich and Esma. And these, these people are just like. I should. I, I should probably just make a playlist of like my favorite music from the Balkans one of these days. I'll do that. Dude, um, you totally should. I would follow that on Spotify. Yeah. I I find most of my Spotify listening is like curated playlists by just like random like Spotify users. Like fuck the editorial playlist. No, totally. And that pay to play bullshit. Like forget about it. But like yeah. you know, I have this this one playlist of like microtonal electronic music that someone oh. has, has curated, and I found so many cool new artists through that playlist, and like a lot of um. A lot of like uh, Middle Eastern um, yeah. um, microtonal electronic music is a thing. I have to and, check like, that out. 
Yeah, I, lo- I love, I love it's like Sevish. Oh my god, I am all like S E V I S H. I am all about it. He like, he is like the microtonal dude. Like he'll write tunes and like you know like like fifty tone equal temperament and stuff. Like just That's obnoxiously so like like my crazy micro. I don't even know how he programs his instruments to that, that level out. of resolution. But <laughs> the music itself is musically amazing. Like I find a lot of the time when people take like a academic approach to music, like you're like, okay, I see that that's a concept you're thinking about, but I don't want to listen to this shit, you know? Totally. But Sevish is like super nice. I love that. Super yeah, I mean, nice. to be honest, that's another thing that kind of has attracted me to a lot of like Balkan and Turkish music because like so many of this music, like you'll be at a wedding in, in, in like Macedonia, right? And like everyone will be dancing and having the time of their life, like as if it was like a, a Justin Timberlake song, but it's like a song in seven with, with, uh, with with an 18 note scale <laughs> yeah they're all about the microtonal music you know and it's like Super and, cool. it's, and and and, and it work and then cause it's not academic it's like oh this rhythm is just sick and like that scale is just sick like it just I, works I, anytime you know? there's like a flattened second the second I am exactly on board anytime exactly. there's a flattened second i'm just like man. sign me up minor second sign me up totally man like like here like <laughs> So that's the major second, the minor second, the, the note in between. It's like, oh, I feel you, man. That's my favorite note. <laughs> yeah, it's super good. Like I'm always rocking the Phrygian mode and stuff. Yeah, like, man, like that, that, yeah. that half minor second. Oh. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah and you like, don't hear that because that was uh that was the devil's interval in Western music. Like that right. was that was that was naughty stuff. Totally, man. And like same thing like with the blues, like so much so much of what I love about like I think a lot of what gives the blues its feeling is is like the like you go to play the notes in the piano, it's like, oh, it's not a minor third, it's not a major third, it's like right in between. <laughs> and that is or, so or, powerful. When it has the fourth, the yes. fourth sharp and the fifth, because and the fifth is like blues, yeah <laughs> you know, exactly like, like, is that, it's like well, that's if you have all three of them then what is that step in the middle yeah. exactly exactly um right. no i love that so, so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to find this playlist you're talking about this microtonal electronic yeah, it's music. microtonal electronic music playlist uh i've been listening to a lot of um prepared piano music um like you know like like john cage and stuff like yeah. when you like have a bunch of objects inside the piano that like rattle yeah. and strings dead and stuff and you get this like for sort of like like stockhausen and like i've been listening to a lot of steve reich love steve yeah reich. i love steve reich man like the music for airport airports it's like one of my favorite records like it's so like oh, it's so it's as bad. if he had a did he have a sampler or was, are the yeah, guys actually the machines they did okay because i'm like there's no way a violinist is doing that for like five minutes <laughs> Well, you'd be surprised. Yo, you should check out like um their YouTube videos of his performances and like watching people actually play music for 18 musicians is like insane. They have these like two marimba players playing like exactly identical parts, and then one of them has to like drift the phase like so slowly wow. back and forth. I'm like, how does a human being play this? And it's just like because like I don't know, like there there'll be times when I'm like uh you know i do melodics to work on my chops you know that mm. software melodics is kind of like guitar hero but with a real piano no uh, I don't, that's cool oh, it's super dope like for finger drumming or piano or whatever it's, hey, that's sick. you get the guitar hero style um score and then you're playing a real instrument and so sick and so, so, yeah it's so I great don't... so i do it but like sometimes when you're doing like the exact same thing like like it's like um uh, what's it called semantic satiety where like where you say the word car until it doesn't mean car anymore and your brain turns to mush you know wow. it's like the same kind of thing where you'll be playing this like exactly the same music passage and it's easy for the first 10 times and then you get to like time number 50 or something totally. and your brain is just like maxed out on this pattern and then like this other weird thing happens in your brain apparently like when you're playing steve reich because you have to play the exact same fucking thing mechanically over and over and you're just like drifting like you know over the course of like 20 repetitions you'll drift like a quarter note off and back and it's just like 
apparently like just incredibly challenging to play it. Oh my gosh. Who, like who have played it are just like, yeah, that was that was tough. It's amazing. <laughs> It'd be fun. Yeah. yeah, you should check out the YouTube videos, man. Steve Rice. I YouTube. will. Amazing, really, really. Man, you're you're like you're you're deep cat, man. I love this. This is so fun. It's rare yeah, that I get to talk to fun. We got we got to make more music together and hang out I more. That, I think man. that's the moral. That's the moral of the story here. Yeah, man. No, I um, love it. I'm... Word. So, um, okay. Well, I think we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to probably call it because okay. you know it's how long this has been. This is I don't know. We don't really have a set length or anything, but um, <laughs> set length. Well, you're ready, you're ready to tour again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll be on tour again by the time this interview's over. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, oh, but yeah, man. so be sure to check out Balkan Bump. Your your Balkan Bump you. everywhere. Yeah, right? yeah, Balkan Bump uh, everywhere. That's that's the power of think... having a fresh original name. Yeah, you know, I don't think I had Balkan to do Bump thirty eight underscore. I think I think my email has like is like Balkan Bump one at Gmail because I like accidentally made Balkan Bump and then like forgot the password and had no oh, recovery you... email. <laughs> oh man, <That's laughs> but brutal. but other than You're that, squatting your own domain. Yeah, but other than that, it's all good. Other than that, so yeah, just add Balk and Bump everywhere. Uh, be sure to check out my remix of Nomad Slang. Yes. Uh, which is, well, kind of, I probably by the time you're watching this, but. Uh, yeah, and it's crushing. And, and, uh, and I'm so I'm so honored you you put the time and really slayed it. Because like I'm I said so, before, it's like, I was like so giddy when I when I heard it. I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. Yeah, um, our quarter and, notes, it's all the beats are divided into five. That's what Instead you're saying four. over there. Holy so shit. The police. Yeah, five. I can't believe that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to listen. I I literally had no idea you were doing like five tuplets. Uh, so yeah, they're even. Look. There's no swing. Yeah. It's exact quintuplets. That's perfect. And that's kind of um, what you were talking about before. Like because it feels natural and not like not academic. It like I didn't even notice. You know, it just yeah. felt good. I mean, sneak it in there. It. Just sneak it in there. Um, all right, lots of love. Um, yeah, man. Thank Likewise. You so much, Will. I really appreciate thank you. You, uh, you being on here. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch about the collab. Cool. And Sounds you great, should man. all be in touch too out there in the audience. Uh, we want to hear your remixes. Yes, uh, I emailed it to you. Uh, and uh, yeah, big up. All right, Catch thanks, you brother. Around. All right, you Peace take out. care. Step in my dojo. Step, step, step. Step in my dojo. You step in my.